Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our panel. Reputational risk in banking. Is Operation Choke Point the answer? I'm Sandra Ikuta, a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Before I introduce the panel, I'd like to begin with some housekeeping items. If you're in the audience, you may send text-based questions through the Q&A tab in the upper right corner of your screen. There's also a chat tab for attendees to chat with each other. Uh, don't use chat to ask questions, however. We'll also be allowing attendees to ask live questions later in the program by pressing the raise hand button. You'll need a working microphone to use this option. Okay, now uh, to our panelists. Um, but I'd like to start just by saying I read the district court's decision in a case challenging Operation Choke Point with great interest. The district court held that it was plausible, though just barely, that the FDIC had deprived the payday lenders of a liberty interest. Uh, I think it was this decision that led the government to settle the case and promised that uh, regulatory threats, undue pressure, coercion, and intimidation have no place in the FDIC. So I'm very interested in hearing the behind the scenes version of this story with our panelists. Since you have the uh, panelist bios in your material, I'll be very brief. Uh, Greg Baer is the president and chief executive officer at the Bank Policy Institute. Previously, he served as executive vice president and general counsel of the Clearinghouse Payments Company which is the largest private sector payments operator in the United States. Next is Chris Peterson. He's a professor of law at University of Utah, S.J. Quinney College of Law. From 2012 to 2016, he served as a special advisor at the United States Consumer Financial Protection Bureau during the Obama administration. Next, we have Christina Skinner. She's Associate Professor of Legal Studies and Business Ethics at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. She was previously legal counsel for the Bank of England. And finally, we have Brian Brooks, the CEO of Binance United States. He was previously the acting comptroller of the currency during the Trump administration. We'll start uh, with opening remarks from each of the panelists and then give each panelist a chance to respond to the other panelists' remarks. So let's start with Mr. Baer. Thanks very much. Very good to be here with you. Um, I should emphasize I'm currently on vacation. I say that only because I want to make clear that the deplorable piece of artwork over my right shoulder is not one I have purchased or leased. Um, with that important caveat, uh, I was going to start off just with a little bit of history on reputational risk. Um, it's sort of a little definitional work, and then that'll maybe lay the groundwork for some of the other panelists. Um, what's really interesting to me, and I've been following this for some time, um, is that reputational risk really didn't play a role in examination until the 1990s. I would very much commend to you some work in a recent law review article by uh, Professor Julie Anderson Hill at the University of Alabama, who actually did extraordinary research on this. So I'll quote from her, which I thought was interesting. So she said, in 1996, the OCC rewrote portions of its examination manuals covering credit card lending, mortgage banking, and allowance for loan and loss reserves to include detailed discussions of reputational risk. The other federal regulators also began integrating it into their frameworks. Today, the Federal Reserve's Bank Examination Manual uses reputation or reputational 190 times. The FDIC's manual uses it 50 times. The OCC's Large Bank Examination Manual uses reputation 45 times. Even specialized examination manuals like those for IT and any money laundering are replete with references to reputation. Impressive considering the reputation risk was hardly mentioned 25 years ago. Now, coming from forward from the 1990s, over the past 10 years, really the biggest change has been how the agencies enforce their views of reputational risk. Um, interestingly, again, according to Professor Hill, when they first adopted the risk-based assessments, they assured banks that no major changes would be required. Indeed, the OCC even clarified that examiners would only monitor, not, quote, actively supervise, end quote, 
reputational risk. Clearly that has changed. Um, you sometimes see uh, enforcement orders that reference reputational risk, but much more importantly is that through the uh, secret examination process where everything is considered confidential supervisory information, um, examiners routinely will, will cite reputational risk as a reason for an MRA or matter requiring attention. Don't wanna to get too into the weeds there, but basically an MRA is a mandate issued through the examination process of something the bank has to fix. Um, it's done outside the public view and it's really a quasi enforcement action uh, because a failure to remediate it can affect the bank's ability to grow, its management rating, and can also, speaking from personal experience, although not my personal experience, get the person who's responsible for it fired at the bank. Um, so now clearly it is no longer a monitor. This is, has been you know, at least, you know, since 2010, an active part of supervision. So an interesting question, why the change in the 1990s and 2010? Here, I don't have Professor Hill's rigor, but I do have some theories. Uh, first in the 90s, capital regulation become much, became much more quantifiable and objective. So less, I think, of an examiner focus. Um, in 2010, consumer uh, uh, examination, interpretive and, uh, and enforcement authority was transferred from the banking agencies to the CFPB. Um, so that was uh, no longer, at least by law, part of their mandate. Also importantly, you know, post 2010, in the wake of the financial crisis, banks really lost the power and will to push back too much on, on, on examiner mandates. Um, and so, you know, really reputational risk was a way, I think, for um, the examination teams to remain relevant, to, to retain authority over consumer, and also, you know, to not have to worry about it being reviewed again, because this is all going on behind the scenes where we can't see it. So, you know, if to paraphrase, love means never having to say you're sorry, reputational risk means never having to explain your rationale. So what exactly is reputational risk? Um, it, they define, regulars define it quite broadly, including remarkably listing themselves among the stakeholders whose view of your reputation is relevant. So it's sort of a bootstrapping uh, l'état c'est moi kind of view of reputational risk. Um, but really it is um, an exception to the general rule that um, the focus of examination regulation should be on violations of law or on unsafe or unsound practices that pose a material financial risk, um, also known as safety and soundness. And I think, you know, as you'll be hearing more from the other panelists, once you, you know, remove those two guardrails of legality and materiality, there really isn't a lot to constrain the use of reputational risk uh, as a mandate. Um, you know, and of course, you know, again, others will cover this more than I, it's fairly easy for a view of reputational risk to become a rather politicized view, um, which is one reason I've actually been so um, critical of it, because ultimately there isn't a lot of difference between saying this activity may be legal and it's not causing a material financial risk, but it causes a reputational risk and saying, I just don't like this. Um, and so I think that's been the core concern. Um, as an aside, I note, and here I actually did some research, um, you know, the, one of the foundational views of this is, well, it may not be a present material financial risk or violation of law, but it's still a, somehow a safety and soundness problem. And there, I, I thought it was kind of interesting to look at the Wells Fargo example, as, as I think it's clear that Wells Fargo, uh, starting in September 2016, and for the next couple of years, suffered you know, a fairly major reputational damage as a result of some conduct. We won't get into to the conduct, but um, you know, if ever there was a reputational risk event, clearly that was it. So we went and looked at you know Wells Fargo's credit default spreads, which is sort of the best market view of its chance of insolvency um, and failure. And it turns out that during that entire period, um, there was no material impact on it whatsoever. In fact, throughout that entire period, they were trading at near historical lows. So even what I think anyone would acknowledge is perhaps the worst reputational risk event in modern history, um, banking in banking at least, um, had no safety and soundness impact. Um, so you know, I, I think that really is a challenge to the notion. But let's assume counterfactually that you know this is relevant. The next question is. Can bank examiners manage it for banks? Um, again, I think that's a very difficult position to maintain. I mean, I think oil and gas, again, which will come up, I think is a great example. I mean, are you in the present you know, political climate of great conflict? Are you at greater risk for banking oil and gas companies or not banking oil and gas companies if all you're worrying about is your reputation? Um, in fact, does that depend on the outcome of the midterm elections and the 2024 presidential? And should the banking agencies be hiring political consultants to determine that um, and make their assessments based on that. So I, I kind of doubt that. 
So don't want to be too long. So recent developments, I think there's some good news, bad news. Um, this topic actually came up without a lot of notice in the context of a recent agency rulemaking um, about what should constitute a material, uh, you know, MRA. Um, so the a matter requiring attention. So the, the main focus was whether guidance, a violation of guidance alone should be the basis for an MRA, and they said it should not commendably. Um, but in response to, to our comment, actually saying, well, you know, it also should not be based on reputational risk alone when there's no violation of law and no safety and soundness issue. Um, it turns out actually the FDIC came out and said, yes, that is correct. We will no longer base MRAs um, so on, on uh, we will no, no longer issue an MRA on reputational risk when there's no violation of law or unsafe or unsound practice. Uh, the Fed has yet to finalize its rule and is pondering that. Um, interestingly, OCC came out on the other side and refused to say that, um, which I think is a little incongruous with, you know, its fair access proposal, um, which of course is about, you know, and Brian can explain it better, you know, is about the notion that banks shouldn't really be allowed to consider reputational risk in deciding whom they bank. Um, so now it appears that, at least for the time being, that, you know, th there is some, you know, some risk that banks will be told, or at least national banks be told, um, well, no, the, there are reputational risks to banking, uh, oil and gas, or other types of companies, um, and that that edict will come not from the bank or its investors or its shareholders um, or con Congress or others, but rather from its regulatory agency. So with that, um, I've probably overstayed my welcome. Uh, look forward to the chat afterwards, but uh, now let me turn it over to Chris Peterson. Well, th thank you, Greg. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks to, to all the staff at the uh, Federal Society for setting up uh, this online conference. It's nice to get together and visit with folks. And, and frankly, I'll also say that it's an honor to be invited. Um, uh, this is the first, um, I think this is the first uh, 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 panel I've done for a Federal Society event. Um, and it's also the first uh, time I've been on a panel that's been moderated by a sitting United States Court of Appeals judge. So I'd like to thank the, thank her honor for uh, joining us today too. Well, um, I, I'll uh, uh, try to give a little bit of context. First, my, uh, maybe uh, four points. One, um, uh, I uh, were, did work in the Obama administration. The, the heading of our panel today is Operation Choke Point. And I suppose it's fair to say that I was in some of the meetings, um, uh, the interagency meetings that, that talked about the, the, the formation of this you know, so-called operation. Um, I worked at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, operation Choke Point was really a Department of Justice Consumer Protection Branch uh, 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 show. Um, and, there was, and there was also some related uh, stuff that was going on at the Control of the Currency and the FDIC. But uh, essentially, my understanding of what that was was really not about favoritism of one particular agency or one, one particular industry, I should say, or another. It was really about trying to um, ensure that banks weren't facilitating violating state laws, and in particular, um, doing so in ways that were fraudulent. The original subpoenas for Operation Choke Point were issued under FIREA, the bank fraud statute that facilitates prosecution, so civil um, uh, cases against uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, companies or individuals that commit bank fraud. Um, and in particular prominent in that was what was going on in the online high cost lending industry at the time, sometimes called payday loans, but also installment loans or open end lines of credit with that have typical average interest rates in that marketplace of over 600% APR and are often marketed to very low income uh, uh, consumers. Th th these loans are very dangerous loans. Now I know that there is disagreement out there in, in the academic circles and amongst economists, and I suspect amongst many Federalist Society members about whether or not usury laws are a good idea. But there is a super majority support for usury laws amongst both Republicans and Democrats all across the country. And uh, in many states across the country, uh, uh, pay, online payday loans at the time were 100% illegal. Uh, they were uh, being, they were circumventing state usury laws by partnering with Indian tribes that had sovereign and immunity and could not be brought to, you know, brought, brought to court by state attorneys general uh, or by individual private plaintiffs. And that was further buttressed by uh, arbitration clauses that were preventing class action lawyers or even individuals from getting a day in court. And many of the arbitration uh, 
uh, uh, forums were really illusory. They were uh, so-called tribal councils that did not actually <laughs> engage in any, real. there was really no arbitral forum. It was a way to deflect um, uh, attention and litigation over illegal practices. Uh, but these were big businesses that were doing billions of dollars of illegal transactions, uh, and the money was flowing through major banks. So the, the premise of it was to try to uh, a, a, attack some of these illegal online practices that, that were creating real harm for consumers across the country, violating state laws and also violating federal law because the federal racketeering statute makes collecting an unlawful debt, which is defined as two times uh, an unenforceable debt that's two times a federal or state uh, usury limit, the interest rate. Um, so, so these were illegal loans. It wasn't about favoritism. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, several of the leading uh, CEOs in this business were eventually prosecuted by the Justice Department and are currently in prison. Um, and, and it's also fair to say that the, the largest bank that was processing payments for uh, the largest company ended up paying, which was U.S. Bank, don't mean to call them out by, by name, but that's just, you know, it's a historical fact. They paid a $613 million fine uh, uh, for, uh, you know, money laundering for these e illegal online loans. Now, of course, uh, that being said, it, it, it's it's not. I agree that it's not okay to try to you know use reputational risk or or favoritism for one industry over the other. But oftentimes, there are underlying disputes in our society about what is legal and what's not legal. And because of the lack of clarity and the difficulty of getting legislation through Congress in a timely manner, it's it's the, the simple reality of the banking business right now and the payments business is that those. Those online, those payment uh, systems become proxy battles for deciding what's legal and what's not legal. And it's particularly likely to happen where there are marketplaces, industries that uh, are unpopular or, or where there are lots of state and local laws being passed all across the country that could affect whether or not transactions in that industry are legal. Uh, and what that in turn does is increase the monitoring costs that banks face when uh, they're deciding to make, you know, to process ACH payments or credit card payments or debit card payments. So I guess my next point then is that I think that it is entirely appropriate for ACH originators, uh, 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 credit card uh, uh, originate, uh, receivable originators, uh, debit card originators to pay risk adjusted prices to banks in difficult to monitor markets. So if your product or service is very similar to something that's illegal and uh, the underwriter that's deciding whether or not to process that payment for the bank can't tell whether or not you're engaging in something that's illegal or not without really digging in and doing some legal research, it's appropriate for that bank to charge you a higher risk adjusted premium. Uh, and that's just simple uh, market uh, market economics that's functioning in the way that we should all anticipate it should. Um, and then I, I, I suppose last point, and I'll stop. Um, uh, I, I think that, in, ironically, banks are doing, uh, the, in, in doing that, banks are doing something very important about preserving the mixed federalist society that we have in our country, where state governments and their elected representatives have the right and should be able to take a stand on uh, 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 commerce that they think is inappropriate and pass laws that uh, uh, regulate those the, that that commerce, and in turn uh, uh, by discriminating between which banks, uh, or sorry, which which uh, 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 merchants are engaged in legal versus illegal activity in, in deciding whether or not to uh, offer payment processing and other banking services to those merchants. Uh, banks are in, in fact reinforcing the rule of law and preserving our democratic institutions. Uh, so I think that with that, uh, there's a lot of positive things that are happening here. But of course, I, I certainly agree um, with Greg that uh, it's not appropriate for uh, any bank examiner to, you know, use their own personal opinions or preferences. Uh, it's about following the law and uh, uh, doing the work that is necessary to protect banks from the risk of having broken those laws and having to pay penalties or incur um, uh, liability on behalf of their shareholders. All right. Well, I'm going to stop there. Uh, and I think uh, next is um, uh, Christina, uh, Professor Skinner, uh, uh, passing it off to you. All right. Well, thanks very much, Chris, for that handoff. And also my thanks to the Federalist Society for having me on this panel today. So 
I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about central banks, which is the area of my own academic research. And I want to suggest to you in doing so that there are a few other legal hooks, if you will, aside from the traditional sort of reputational risks that we've been discussing so far, that could be available to the Fed, the US Central Bank, to deter banks from lending to certain disfavored industries. Now, I want to be perfectly clear, I don't believe that that's where we are right now with their balance sheets. You see that these banks are exposed somewhere in the range of 2% to 6%. When you look at their wholesale loans, focusing on things like automotives, oil and gas, and even adding in transportation, broader categories. You know, So the point is that even if all of these loans had to be written off the bank's balance sheet, the equity cushion of these institutions would cover those losses, you know, two, three times over. But nevertheless, we still see this real desire for the Fed to make a connection between financial stability and climate change because doing so opens the door to a range of different policy interventions. So a second example to flag for you is, again, going to the safety and soundness issue. So the Fed's ability to make a safety and soundness determination in its supervisory capacity is another thing to consider. So there is this language in the Bank Holding Company Act that gives the Fed very broad authority to decide with a lot of latitude what presents that kind of safety and soundness issue for a bank. And so under that authority, like other regulators, the Fed can do things like examine banks' underwriting practices and keep tabs on asset quality. It's known to be a flexible standard, as others have said, and the Fed has previously been criticized for being opaque in the way that it uses supervisory discretion to lean or to nudge on banks to do or not do certain things. You know, and this can raise concerns in the context of climate change with this sort of pressure, this ability to exert pressure on banks to divest from certain lending activities. Now, I have faith that the Fed leadership right now will be and will continue to be judicious in the use of its supervisory power where climate is concerned. So the current vice chair for supervision, Randy Quarles, he's been very vocal about pressing for greater transparency and supervision. Kevin Styro, who until recently was heading supervision at the New York Fed, and now he's leading a lot of the board's work on climate, you know, I think is very much of the view that the Fed should remain faithful to statutory convention and constraints when it comes to climate supervision. I think the real point here is that there's a lot of discretion that's hardwired into the statutory language. So what the Fed ultimately does down the road can vary with leadership changes. So in other words, there is this opening to political pressure that can have some impact where supervision is concerned. And of course, this isn't unique to climate, but like I said, it's very much a live issue right now. So we're here to review the executive branch. So I want to discuss how the current administration's decision to put climate very high on the agenda, you know, fits into what the Fed is doing in this space. So nominally, and via some statutory bulwarks, the Fed is independent from the political branches and especially from the executive branch. So left to its own independent devices, I do think we see the Fed working very hard to be responsive on the one hand, to increasing calls to consider how climate change can impact its various mandates while remaining apolitical and technocratic. But I certainly see a beachhead for the executive branch to influence the Fed in this space, especially where these climate decisions are concerned via the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC. So the FSOC is this post-crisis innovation created by the Dodd-Frank Act. It's a council of regulators. It's not a regulator itself, but it has the power to designate non-bank financial institutions as systemically important, thereby porting them over into the Fed's jurisdiction. And it also has the power to make non-binding recommendations to its member agencies. So if you look at the first principal meeting that the FSOC had at the end of March, the entire focus was on climate. So Secretary Yellen elicited, provided opportunity for comment from the members on how their respective agencies were handling climate change. And there was a special presentation allocated for the Fed. Now, to me, this is unmistakably soft pressure on the Fed to put its foot on the gas where climate change is concerned. So for those that favor a whole of government approach to tackling the climate, the Fed seems to be dragging its feet. Now, objectively, I think though the Fed is going slowly because as I've just been discussing, you know, it's not at all clear that it has the legal authority to do much more about climate change other than engage in research, 
and supervise banks' balance sheet for known exposures to climate change. So this microprudential space, right? Mortgages and flood prone areas, loans to coal plants, other major fossil fuel producers, you know, but to go even further for the FSOC to issue a non-binding recommendation to the Fed to consider financial stability issues more. I think we should hope for the sake of the Fed's independence and preserving this line between monetary and fiscal that we don't get there. So to wrap up, you know, I want to give you the big picture. Why do we care? Certainly with choke point and the OCC's fair access rule, the emphasis was very much on fairness, clarity, due process. So I want to flag a few other rule of law concerns at stake if the Fed were to wade more deeply into these waters. So first, there's an age old slippery slope problem. Truly, once you put the Fed in the business of deterring banks from lending to this sector or another that the executive has determined to be against economic or national interests, what's next? Second, there's a broader question of how large a role you want a central bank to play in society. There has to be some line drawing about what is a job for the Fed and what is not. There are a lot of significant economic issues that affect our society, trade, immigration, tech disruption, just to name a few. You know, the question is, do we want this central bank leviathan? And then finally, it's a bit anti-democratic to put the Fed in the business of making judgments about what's in or out of a green perimeter. And I doubt very much the Fed wants this job either. Fed leaders exercise unelected power. And we really should want the democratically responsive institutions out in front here making decisions about how to allocate credit in this very fine grained kind of way. So the Fed is designed to remain sector neutral, to remain faithful to these fundamental principles of Republican small r kinds of government. And so I think it's important to preserve the Fed's ability to exercise that neutrality. So with that, I will conclude and hand it over to Brian Brooks. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate the chance to be here. <clears throat> I, I have to say, this is the first Federal Society panel I've ever been on where I'm going to be the most conservative voice, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to, <laughs> to exercise that uh, that privilege. Um, I, I want to sort of cover four, uh, or I'll cover the topic in, in four basic ways. So uh, first of all, I want to talk about several dimensions of reputational risk uh, in terms of what I, as a former bank regular, think it, it should mean and can plausibly mean versus what is kind of morphed into meaning. So I'll talk about that. Uh, I want to talk about choke point in particular because I think the specifics of both Operation Choke Point and then later the set of bank practices that led to the fair access rule uh, need to be unpacked much, much more specifically in order for people uh, on this uh, uh, webinar to really understand what's going on. Uh, because if it were just about climate change or even mostly about climate change, I think it'd be a very different discussion. I then want to put all of this in the frame of who in a market democracy should be making cost benefit decisions about things. Uh, I think for uh, in a bunch of ways, we moved in sort of a univariate direction. And I'm going to suggest that's not uh, not a sustainable approach to decision making. And then finally, I'll tell you a little bit about the story of fair access and, and what it was really supposed to be about and how at the OCC we tried to balance considerations of privately owned banking on the one hand with sort of antitrust and market power considerations on the other and try and point a way forward uh, as to how we might actually have these discussions in a way that works for a pluralistic society, uh, many of whom don't agree with each other. So let me start first of all with the concept of reputation risk and run through a few features uh, that I think should be discussed in, in, in some detail. So the first issue is, you know, reputation risk can have both a subjective and an objective meaning. Um, objective is sort of easy to define, and a lot of banks will have risk measurements uh, about when they've triggered a high severity reputational risk event. But there's a risk whenever you talk about reputational risk that you will morph into pure personal opinion about what's good for the world or what choices you might want to make. So examples of this would be, you know, it's obviously a reputational risk if, for example, you have a CEO who is uh, using drugs or who is uh, having extramarital affairs or who is speculating in the financial markets and incurring enormous losses and that's going to get written up in the newspaper and cause customers to flee or potentially raise questions actually about the stability of the institution. You could quantify that and many institutions do. They'll define very specifically what counts as a reputational risk, okay, and then they will ask themselves is it a one-time story in a local newspaper or a sustained story in a series in the New York Times and they'll have different severity levels uh, on their internal severity scale for that, which marries up to a risk tolerance. 
that one could measure, a board could govern, and you could define. Uh, versus saying, well, a bank that banks fossil fuel companies um, is reputationally risky. Well, that's in the eye of the beholder. Every single person on this webinar used fossil fuels today, uh, every single one of us. So is it reputationally risky or not? Uh, that's sort of a subjective and opinion question. And so in defining how an examiner and a regulator should look at this, one has to first make the decision of how much subjectivity and discretion are you willing to indulge. And as Greg said, that's one of the reasons when I was running the OCC that we put out a rule about guidance versus regulations. And we made very clear that the subjective opinions of individual examiners, let alone the non-APA approved guidance of an agency, uh, won't be cause for sanctions or enforcement actions. Uh, at least on our watch. So that was intended to address in part the subjective versus objective part. There is then the question of outcome determ uh, determinativeness versus viewpoint neutral approaches to reputational risk. Again, I'll take, I'll take ESG and specifically climate change concerns as an example. I was often asked when I was the acting controller um, to take action to, uh, to look at what was referred to as transition risk. And I would say to the people who were calling me about this, I would say, well, what, what exactly is transition risk? And they would say, well, it's the risk that banks will not adapt quickly enough or that their customers won't adapt quickly enough to the coming abolition of fossil fuels. To which I would say, well, what if there is no abolition? I mean, you're presuming a political conclusion. You want there to be an abolition of fossil fuels and you believe by forcing banks to acknowledge that as a risk, we will cut off funding and then, and then we'll have a transition which is what creates the risk in the first place. There's, of course, an alternative viewpoint, which was to let the price mechanism and markets decide what the appropriate mix of fossil fuels is. And that then sort of addresses the presumption, but not the fact, that there's a transition risk. So if your outcome that you've already predetermined is that we're going to abandon fossil fuels as part of our overall energy mix, that would dictate one approach to reputational risk. But if you didn't presuppose that, and if you assumed that we still lived in a market democracy, and people through their elected representatives and markets would make that judgment, the risk calculus would be very different. But resolving which it is, is, is an open question. And then finally, I would say, there is the question of minority rights you know, in a constitutional democracy, which is to say, what rights should people whose preferences are in the minority, but not the trivial minority have to obtain goods and services that they want? So an example might be, uh, you know, if you're from a small rural place like I am, where hunting is a weekend pastime, your view about whether banks should process payments for shotguns and ammunition might be very different from if you live in Los Angeles or New York, where culturally you're probably opposed to the idea of widespread firearm ownership. But in Pueblo, Colorado, every house has a gun and people buy them with their credit cards every day. So there is the viewpoint that I think many of us who are on these kind of panels sometimes miss, which is we import our cultural preferences because we live in certain bubbles, we interact in certain communities, but we live in a really big country where many, many people don't have the preferences that we have and actually don't agree with some of our most foundational assumptions. So the question is, what role does financial regulation play in shaping those assumptions versus in enabling people to kind of do the things that they want? Which leads me to the second point I want to talk about, and that is let's get much more specific about choke point. OK, so we've heard from from previous uh, discussants on this panel, the concept that choke point was really about sort of enforcing laws or Giving, uh, giving voice to, I think one of the comments was uh, preserving our democratic institutions while reinforcing the rule of law. So let me just walk through uh, for you some of the things that were affirmatively listed by the FDIC during its formal Operation Choke Point process. These were things that were designated as categories that were high risk and thus should be avoided by FDIC ins uh, uh, insured institutions. And then we can unpack and see whether in fact these things are rule of law issues or not. So one category of business that the FDIC deemed high reputationally risky and unbankable was uh, dating sites, uh, dating sites like Match.com and Bumble and Tinder. Now, last year, 35 million Americans were on dating sites. The total market cap of dating sites in the United States was in excess of $60 billion, and they were not illegal in any state. Uh, and yet the FDIC said in 2014 that those sites were in inherently risky as a category and were subject to, at a minimum, enhanced due diligence and very likely debanking under the thing that was called Operation Choke Point. A second category of companies that was uh, deemed to be inherently risky was pawn shops. Pawn shops are licensed by the state governments of every state where they exist. They're licensed money transmitters uh, with MTL licenses in almost every state. They're not only not illegal, they're licensed by state governments. Uh, and yet, again, the FDIC listed them on the list of inherently risky uh, businesses that shouldn't be subject to IDI banking, 
along with such other uh, reputationally risky businesses as fireworks dealers. Uh, again, I could be from a different part of the country than uh, some other people, but uh, buying fireworks for the 4th of July was a very common practice in my neighborhood. Ammunition sales, uh, again, I mentioned the hunting culture that exists in much of the middle part of the country. Uh, one of my favorites was the category of, quote, racist materials. Now, the FDIC uh, website didn't describe exactly what that meant, but as, as I think we've seen in the last year or two, there's a wide variety of opinion on what constitutes racist uh, materials uh, with all of its first, dimension, uh, first Amendment dimensions. Tobacco sales was deemed to be inherently reputationally risky, telemarketing, and a series of other things, none of which uh, is illegal under the laws of any state. So that was choke point 1.0. And, and the point here is to say that it was A, not focused on climate change, B, highly subjective, and I would argue uh, politically elitist uh, to say that some of these things shouldn't be used. Many of us don't go to pawn shops, but millions of our countrymen do. And why it should be that we should make choices for that is at least something that our democratic institutions, as opposed to our administrative institutions, ought to be talking about in, in, my, in my judgment. Which brings me to the third topic that I wanted to just put on the table, having to do with not only who makes these decisions in this country, but how do we make the decisions? So the problem with having administrative agencies make decisions is every administrative uh, agency in the United States, perhaps there's an exception I can't think of, but every one I can think of, is focused on a particular mission. So at the OCC, our mission was the safety and soundness of the banking system. And at the OCC, we didn't know a darn thing about health policy. We have absolutely zero expertise in environmental science or climate change. What we know a lot about is credit and bank operations. That's what we know about. By contrast, you know, we have the CDC, which knows a lot about public health, but absolutely nothing about financial services. So it's a weird world, uh, for example, when you have the CDC prohibiting foreclosures. Uh, it would be as though you had the OCC prohibiting mask mandates or prohibiting social distancing. Neither agency knows a darn thing about the others and is not well situated to make cost benefit analyses. What they're well situated to do is to explain the risks of a, a given policy within their vertical, okay? The entities in the United States, in my belief, that make cost-benefit analyses are really two. They are the elected branches of government, where we elect leaders to say we will accept this much risk for that much benefit on a given thing. For example, we will raise the speed limit from 55 to 75, knowing that it will cost lives because the efficiency gains on net are better for society than the relatively marginal cost of life. But you could make a different decision and NHTSA probably would make a different decision, but our democratic institutions don't do that. You see it with COVID, where we save a certain number of lives in certain categories at the expense of other things. If the democratic organs of government made that choice, it might be different, and it's the same thing in the world of economic policy. Who can say how much climate change is worth how much loss of quality of life in this generation? That's not a decision for the FDIC to make, I would argue. It's a decision for either the Congress to make, because we elect them to make those balancing judgments, or for markets to make through the price uh, the price mechanism where people can decide what they really want. But I would argue that the bank regulators are ill-suited to do that kind of a thing. Which then brings me to the last point, which is what was the fair access rule? How does it relate to reputational risk? And why did we do it in the first place? So the why is where I'll start just very, very quickly. And, and here I will tell you that while the things that we saw banks starting to debank were different from the things uh, that we saw in choke point in the earlier part of the decade, they were still widespread and mostly had nothing to do with climate change. So whereas in original choke point, we saw dating sites being boycotted, pawn shops, firework sales, and, and uh, tobacco, among other things. In the second version, when I was running the OCC, we saw banks, um, including some of the biggest banks, essentially wholesale deplatforming all of the following kinds of companies. And when I say deplatforming, I don't mean refusing to make loans to them because there was credit risk. I mean literally canceling checking accounts and taking them out of the financial system. So I'm talking about things, and again, you may find these sketchy. I find these sketchy, but private prisons, okay, which are companies engaged by almost a majority of US states to provide correctional services as government contractors, wholesale debanked by several of the largest banks. Gun manufacturers, including for hunting rifles and things that are sort of accepted American pastimes, again, wholesale debanked. Weirdly, um, on the other side of the political aisle, we saw a mass movement to try and get banks to debank family planning agencies like Planned Parenthood, because again, they were politically unpopular among a certain segment of the society. And then yes, also including oil and gas companies uh, for various reasons. 
Now, to be super clear, I'm a lifelong member of the Sierra Club. I grew up in Colorado. I, I'm an outdoors person. I actually have a significant degree of concern over climate change. But I have an even greater degree of concern over how we make these judgments as a society, because what I do know is that there are not environmental scientists on staff, nor was anyone at the OCC or the Fed elected to make environmental judgments for the United States. We elect democratic representatives to make those kinds of judgments. And when the Congress decides not to enact gun control, or when it decides not to enact national cafe standards of a certain kind, the idea that we need unelected regulators to quote, fill the void, ought to trouble us when the people we elected to make those decisions have decided that that's the wrong decision for us. That that becomes sort of a government of kind of the Solomonic guardians uh, or the platonic guardians rather than a government of, of the people or of free people acting through markets. So the point of the fair access rule was simply to say this. It was to say, listen, banks are privately owned and in the main, they can make decisions as they want to make them. But there are two legal constraints on those decision makings that it do exist in statute. One of them is the existing antitrust laws, which apply to banks as much as they apply to any other commercial company. And so we framed the fair access rule in terms of a constraint only on banks that can be demonstrated to have pricing power in a particular market segment. So generally speaking, banks can do whatever they want. But if you have actual pricing power in a segment and are refusing to bank a legal business, you have heightened risk obligations uh, to demonstrate why in those circumstances. So it was a very limited rule based on that. The second animating concept behind it was the fact that in Dodd-Frank, which has been discussed a lot on this call, there was a little known provision added to the OCC's organic statute. And that was that in addition to the OCC's historic mission of ensuring safety and soundness of financial services, it also created a new obligation on the OCC to ensure the quote, fair access to financial services. And the question is, what did that mean? Now the term fair access does exist in various places in antitrust law, but it also implies the notion that in the same way that you can't discriminate on account of race or other immutable characteristic, you shouldn't be able to discriminate because you, the bank CEO, just find a given segment icky or not consistent with your own personal political preferences. And so, you know, the fact that you don't like hunting rifles or that you don't uh, want your daughter to have an abortion if you're on the other side of your boycott and Planned Parenthood doesn't mean you can use your federal charter to try and choke off finance to something that the markets want and that our democratically elected representatives have chosen not to outlaw. So that was the concept of fair access. Um, I signed the final rule at the very last minute. It did not get uh, uh, published in the Federal Register, and so it never took effect, as a result of which 30-some uh, senators uh, have introduced legislation to enact it by statute. So we'll see where that debate goes. Look, I think at the bottom line uh, is, it, this is all a question of who decides in a society, and do they subje decide subjectively or objectively? Uh, I've now filibustered long enough, but having lived this, I thought I would just provide some perspective from the guy who actually signed the rule. So I really welcome the conversation. I think it's a great topic, and uh, and I hope that this is not the last time we talk about it. All right. Yeah. We've, we've now heard uh, one round from our panelists, and I feel uh, enlightened or maybe alarmed to hear about the yeah. sorts of political pressure on uh, the banking industry. But I'd like to give our panelists a, a chance to respond to the points that were made. And so I will um, I will do another round and ask uh, Mr. Bear to start us off. Sure. Actually, I, had, I think I had four or five things. Um, first, I, I'm, I'm really glad Professor Skinner raised climate, which wouldn't immediately jump to mind as a reputational risk. But um, there is a really interesting question about what is a financial stability risk. Um, of course, you could view that as very broad and it you know, to the extent that there is, you know, yeah, existential climate change going on, that's a risk to everything. So of course it's financial risk. But what I think you'll be watching and what she alluded to was um, actually more at this point in the UK and Europe, um, I think that she's correct in saying that the, the Fed, I think is a little more cautious here, is the notion of a climate stress test on banks. Um, and that's a very complicated subject. Um, we've written a fair amount about it. If you wanna look, uh, follow us at Bank Policy. Um, well, a lot of it comes down to this question. Suppose you have a 90-day revolving loan to ExxonMobil, um, and the Bank of England or someone's going to conduct a 30-year stress test. Well, what do you assume about that loan? Now, I would tell you as a bank microprudential risk that there's no risk to that loan. 
right? Because if Exxon refuses to change its business model and climate goes as, as it's projected to and Exxon eventually is ruined, well, you just stop rolling that loan over at some point. Um, the concern about the stress test is that they will actually assume first that Exxon never changes its business, second that that loan is rolled over um, every month for the next 30 years, and third that you take no actions to hedge it. You could hedge it by buying CDS on Exxon or you could hedge it by actually lending some green companies that will profit as Exxon fails. Um, so that's sort of a fundamental intractable problem with climate stress testing. Um, fortunately, I think some, some regulators are beginning to realize that. Interestingly, the Banque de France just actually did a, a, a stress test, um, which I think everyone assumed would come up with a huge number, um, perhaps for other reasons. But in fact, they found that bank losses would be quite moderate, even under some rather draconian, um, even counterfactual assumptions. But this is a roaring debate now. Um, again, separate from the notion of, you know, what should we be doing about climate change more generally, but really, is this really a bank, you know, safety and soundness risk? Um, a couple of points on Brian. I mean, first, just on rep risk, and this is kind of an aside, and he's certainly not the transgressor here, but if you think about it, any company in America is kind of at risk if their CEO is um, dating his employees or hers, although it's usually is, um, or taking a lot of drugs, right? It's it's only in banking that you would need to come up with policies and procedures to quantify the risk of your CEO dating too many people or taking drugs. Um, and that's sort of a lot of what the reputational risk exercise has become as a compliance policies and procedures matter. But that's not terribly important. Um, on checkpoint, I mean, you know, I, I think Brian gives great examples of, you know, ac activities that were choked, but completely legal. But I think the broader question, and to some extent, this gets to Chris's remarks, is to the extent that you believe that a given industry is doing something illegal, should the, the, the first action be to investigate that industry and challenge the legality and indict the people who are doing the illegality, or should it be to go to their bank and tell them to stop lending? Um, because ultimately, and I think this is what Brian's driving at, if it's illegal, well, then prosecute the people who are doing illegal things or prosecute the bank for aiding and abetting. Um, but you wouldn't actually say as a sectoral matter, all banks should stop lending to that company or that industry. Um, and then on 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 fair access and 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 just sort of a large larger topic, I mean I think you know Brian noticed noted the first version of choke, which was you know pawn shops, dating sites, etc., and then the second, which was private prisons and gun manufacturers, etc. There's a crucial difference there. In the first, the choke point, that was the government telling all banks, don't do this, right? And so that's a systematic government mandated denial of credit. You know, you can debate how broad it was or where it was, but that's that's one thing. It's a very different thing, it seems to me, if an individual bank decides because its shareholders want it to, or because it believes it will help it more in the market, not to bank a given firm or a given sector. Uh, first of all, I think that's a legitimate concern. Um, but second of all, and perhaps more importantly, if one bank decides not to bank a given company or a or sector, there are thousands of other banks who might. Um, it's only when that reputational mandate comes from the government that it is truly systematic and, and disabling. On the fair access, Brian and I debate this all the time, but I, I would just would just note what, what I think is one problem with, with this notion, which is you, know, you can say we don't want the bank or the CEO to say, I don't like this business. But if you think about how banks work in the United States, most banks don't bank most businesses. It actually requires a lot of special knowledge and investment and resources to do an aircraft leasing business or to bank dentists. There are actually banks that specialize in banking law firms. And so there are lots of banks that say, you know what? I don't want to bank aircraft leasing. I don't want to bank dentists. I don't want to bank lawyers. I, I don't want to do commercial lending in certain areas. Um, and of course, they have to be able to say that. And I know, obviously, that's not what, what the OCC was driving at. But how do you say, OK, well, you are allowed to say for non-financial reasons, you're not going to do a dental practice or an aircraft leasing practice, but you do have to do a gun manufacturer business. And of course, the answer is, well, well, no, we just pick gun manufacturers because that's politically charged. But now, I mean, at that point, the game's over, right? Because now it's the agency deciding what's a politically um, important business that needs that. And then that is not sort of a neutral um, application of banking. That's back to a choke, choke point like thing where certain industries are picked um, for reputational protection. So I just I don't see any way out of that box canyon, which is why I was a little a little down on that proposal, as I think Brian knows. But anyway, that's uh, my five cents. Well, let me turn to uh, Professor Peterson. 
Well, thank you, Judge. Um, so uh, great comments and uh, 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 fun to visit about and chat about all this stuff. I guess, um, first off, I, I think maybe I'll, I'll uh, take my time to respond to uh, Brian's, begin by responding to Brian's list of the the different types of businesses that that uh, had some sort of risks associated with them. Um, it, it first, and, and you left one off. It was the online payday lending industry, which it was engaged in illegal uh, uh, loans. The one that I focused on, but each for each of these businesses that you list, they're legitimate businesses, and I'm not disagreeing about that. But that, but for each of those businesses, I think that there was something that's not about our preferences, but there were complicated underlying legal issues that uh, uh, did not render the banks unbankable, but meant that there probably needed to be a little more due diligence and investigation to whether or not some of the participants in that industry were engaging in some form of illegal activity. So dating sites, completely legitimate, a, a nice, you know, important part of our online commerce, but they also can facilitate romance scams, which the FTC has said has led to about a third of a billion dollars in terribly tragic um, uh, losses for victims of online fraud. And so, uh, you know, at, at what point is, is a dating site facilitating online fraud and what steps do they need to take? Uh, and does the bank need to take to ensure that they're not uh, facilitating online scammers? Pawn shops, of course, are a legitimate financial institution. Uh, and they're regulated by state governments, but they also have had a systemic problem for thousands of years of, of fencing stolen goods. Uh, and there are local rules that uh, deal with that. Some pawn shops are compliant and some are not, and providing banking services to pawn shops might require some additional um, due diligence and investigation. I don't think that anybody, at least I'm not, uh, suggesting that bank uh, pawn shops shouldn't be uh, have access to the banking service system. For fireworks dealers, look, I like fireworks too, uh, uh, but fireworks, uh, it's a complicated patchwork of state and local laws. Fireworks can also lead to wildfires and pollution. Uh, and the laws in Wyoming, Colorado, and my home state of Utah are not all the same, and different cities are not all the same, and some fireworks businesses may be actively circumventing those state laws. And it may be the case that the bank needs to take more time to investigate whether or not some fireworks uh, uh, sales businesses are in compliance with state and local laws before they engage in banking services. And then ammunition sales, of course, we all know that there's a huge controversy about uh, 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 firearms. Uh, and uh, there's also some constitutional protections, but those constitutional protections are unclear. Uh, and different states, uh, Colorado, and uh, where you live, and uh, your home state, and of course, uh, Chicago have very different laws. Uh, and uh, whether or not a merchant is compliant with those laws is a, a difficult question, may require some additional due diligence. The racist stuff, I don't know so much about what's going on with that. It's a tough issue. I'm not sure where we're at on that. Uh, on the tobacco sales, uh, a lot of uh, some tobacco merchants online are attempting to circumvent uh, uh, state and local sales taxes, uh, uh, which is not lawful. And then also uh, telemarketing. Of course, we need telemarketing. Nobody's suggesting they should be unbanked. But uh, some telemarketing uh, operations are at risk for being boiler rooms to you know pump up sell pump up stock prices uh, or engage in, um, you know, uh, uh, fraud and scams. And so uh, it, it, banks that provide payment services, banking services, checking account services to businesses that uh, are different, where it's difficult to know whether or not they're legitimate or whether or not they're licensed properly or not, may need a little bit more attention and due diligence. And then I guess um, responding to um, uh, Greg's excellent point that, you um, you know, we should focus on prosecuting the individual as opposed to using banks as a bank shot to try to enforce the law. Well, I, look, I uh, agree that that's the first choice. Yes, we should prosecute uh, uh, scammers that are engaging in romance scams uh, or pawn shops that are, you know, deliberately engaging in fencing stolen goods uh, or pay. But but the problem is that it's not that easy, is it? Uh, tracking down the online scammer who's, you know, operating from Mumbai or Ukraine uh, uh, or the boiler room that's uh, you know it, it does a, a call center that starts up and immediately shuts down as soon as um, they, they get a certain amount of money that runs through it. It's not that easy, um, uh, and it's especially not that easy when uh, banks uh, wink and nod and knowingly facilitate large businesses that are very profitable that in turn 
uh, uh, create profits that are used to frustrate the law enforcement prosecutions of those same scammers that were breaking the law in the first instance. Uh, so I think that that's the first choice, but we also need to, our, our financial institutions to take responsibility for engaging in reasonable due diligence to screen out illegal activity from uh, our uh, online and, and digital marketplaces. And then I guess last point is that I think that that to say that 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 uh, the position of anybody out there and, and look, there may be some people, but. I, I, I think we need to be very careful not to engage in a straw man fallacy here, where we say that the, the position of these unelected government bureaucrats is to um, uh, uh, render some entire industries unbankable uh, or, or that those, those practices shouldn't be used. Nobody that I'm aware of in any conversation I've ever had in the entire my entire 20 years has ever said that we should not allow people to buy a shotgun. Uh, uh, it's not my position. It's never been anybody's position. Instead, what I think the position is much more nuanced is that we should expect our financial institutions who win extraordinary profits uh, and have, you know, the, the, many of our money center banks have revenue that dwarfs the gross national product of many of the, the country the world's nation states that that we should expect them to engage in some reasonable due diligence and screening to prevent illegal practices from creeping into the banking industry and we should be careful to distinguish what things are illegal and what things are not illegal on that point I, I, I agree with everybody on the panel all right uh, professor Skinner do you have some comments I do, I do. I have two. I have two main comments. I think I'll be relatively brief. You know, the first comment I guess is is for you, Brian. And I agree with everything you said in your excellent presentation, and particularly the remarks that you made in regard to the democratically responsive institutions being out in front making these subjective, value laden decisions. And when I make that point often in my own research, I'm, I'm, I met sometimes, you know, with this skepticism, that's a fairy tale, right? We can't expect the Congress to make these decisions. We're in this period of gridlock. And so therefore we need to lean on these agencies that um, have broadly worded mandates that they can press wider. We can give, you know, let them exercise their discretion, let them develop the expertise, right? Bring on that climate scientist to the Fed or what have you. And, you know, I I find this sort of ends justify the means of difficult to, to respond to and, and wrestle with. And I wonder, um, you know, soliciting your advice really, how you address those remarks other than, you know, saying we, we have a, a system in place that's designed to slow down when the, when the nation is politically divided. And so it's not a democratically appropriate response to say, well, let's short circuit that and use the agencies and use this sort of techno populism, which a colleague of mine has has cleverly coined the term of. Um, so that's one question for you, Brian. And then I guess my second question, comment, remark is for is for Greg in response to some of the things that I've seen you written, um, seen written by you in terms of operational risk and how you know on the one hand operational risk you know is a growing and real threat. You know we're in a world of cyber risk now. On the other hand, I think as you've pointed out you know, it seems a slippery slope to allied operational risk with reputational risk and how do we keep the lines relatively clear there? Um, so I, I, I may be upsetting the course of things by putting questions back into the panel. So Judge, I'll, I'll let you decide how you wanna handle my provocative questions there. Thank you. Well, we'll let uh, Mr. Brooks respond to your question and make any remarks he likes, and then we'll turn it over to Mr. Bayer to respond to your specific question. Well, th th this is this is this is so great. I mean, boy, I wish we could have done this six months ago when some of these things were live. This would have been a great uh, dialogue at the time. So, so let me start uh, if I can, Christina, by answering your question because I think this is this is a super profound question: is what do you do about the gridlock problem? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have spent a lot of the last five years in Silicon Valley where the line about anything that goes wrong in a, in a product is it's a feature and not a bug. But I'm going to argue, actually, that sometimes gridlock uh, is a feature and not a bug. And what I mean by that is um, there are times when what the failure to regulate something means, well, whatever it is, is a decision that not regulating is better than regulating. 
And I think Americans often misunderstand that because we, we have a view nowadays that every single thing on planet Earth needs to be subject to some kind of a regulatory regime. This is why we have state licensing of florists and hairdressers and, you know, an increasing number of activities that we used to just do in a free country, you know, now can't be done with, without some sort of sanction of the state. Classic example in financial services was at the beginning of the Trump administration, when the administration decided to take a different perspective on consumer financial enforcement at the CFPB is a number of states, starting with California, decided, and, and this, was, this was the common phrase that was used, they decided to beef up their state regulatory agencies to quote, fill the void left by the Trump administration. But of course that wasn't a void at all. It was a conscious policy choice. The belief being that the cost of a relatively low level of kind of inherent fraud and loss in the financial markets was more than swamped by the reduction in economic activity and job creation created when banks in particular stayed way, way, way back from whatever the legal uh, line of demarcation was. So not a void, but a conscious policy judgment. Very similar to tax policy, where there are some states that have elected not to charge tax. And it's not because they forgot to, it's because they decided that it's a good thing to leave more zone for private economic activity. And so in, in, in this world, you know, when, when we say, gee, uh, Congress can't be trusted to impose gun control, so we need banks to impose gun control. Well, what if it was the decision of the people's democratically elected representatives not to control guns? I, again, I'm not saying that's a good thing. Remember the old line about all, that Oliver Wendell Holmes said about the democracy, which is, if the American people want to go in a hell, to hell in a handbasket, it's my job to help them get there. That was once the view of, of a democracy. But it seems like today there's a real skepticism where, where elites believe that they know the right answer and they're willing to let Congress have the first crack at it. But if the people's representatives don't agree with them and thus don't impose those restrictions, well, we got to have the restrictions and we'll take anybody who wants to impose it, even if that is banks versus somebody else. So again, I, I think the main point here is sometimes the decision not to do something is a decision. It's not, it's not a failure to make a decision. It is in fact the decision. Let me, let me turn it for a second to something that Chris said about, uh, about uh, some of these categories I was talking about, about dating sites, pawn shops, et cetera. And Chris, I think if I, if I understood your comment, it was, look, no one is saying you can't bank those, uh, those uh, companies. It's just that they're, they have higher risks and thus you have, to, uh, you have to make sure that you're managing those risks specifically. So I, I wish that were true. Uh, I think it would be a different conversation if it were true, but, but candidly, it really isn't. And I can give you two pieces of evidence for that. Uh, the first is that I actually ran one of the country's 50 largest banks during Operation Choke Point. And in that time, in 2012 and 13, we ESA AML policies, which is sort of where all this sat. And we got an MRA from our examiner in charge because we didn't have a policy that blanketly refused to bank pawn shops, among other kinds of companies that were on that list. And we were only able to resolve the MRA by prohibiting all transactions with those kinds of companies. There was no discussion of a risk management framework. We had to prohibit them in order to resolve the MRA. So I've actually sort of personally observed the way that choke point was implemented inside of a large bank. Um, but the other evidence of it is, and, and, and you probably know this from your time during the Obama administration, is in 2014, the OCC looked at two different categories of activity that were being entirely squelched by choke point. And the most famous of these, I mean, there were two really, there was money services businesses, and then there was foreign correspondent banking, which had been identified as part of the evidence that uh, many of the most significant banks had adopted policies based on the FDIC guidance that simply said, we don't bank those sectors. It's not that we'll engage in risk management and enhance due diligence. We simply will not bank foreign correspondent banking activities or money services businesses. And the OCC in the mid Obama administration came out with uh, guidance that said, you can't refuse to bank those as a category, right? So, so Chris, they were saying what you're saying today, which is what you must do instead is determine which among the companies in that sector have effective risk management. And then you can bank those while refusing on an individualized basis to bank those that are not effectively managed, managing those admittedly heightened risks. But that distinction is all the distinction in the world because the industry's response to choke point wasn't to make nuanced decisions, as you say, it was to boycott them entirely. And that's sort of what led to the OCC's regulatory response in 2014. And I guess the last thing I'll do is I'll address Greg's comment, which I think is a really good one, which I agree with. And that is, it's a different thing entirely for the government to prohibit a bank from doing something. 
than it is for privately owned banks uh, to decide on their own that they don't want to be in a given line of business. And, and I think that's definitely true. What I think got badly misunderstood because of just the political tone of the last 12 months is that nothing about the OCC's fair access rule challenges that assumption. So we had two or three key points in fair access that were designed to, to uh, kind of acknowledge Greg's point. The first is, if in fact there are lots of other banks banking a given sector, so if it's really true that your bank doesn't want to do factoring or whatever, but other banks are doing it, that's totally fine. Totally fine. That's why we built it around an antitrust concept where the rule only imposed obligations on banks that had market power, right? Because the definition of market power is if you exit the market, either the product will not be available or you're such a big part of the market that prices will rise. And we do that kind of antitrust analysis in every other industry in America. So why wouldn't that apply in the banking business is, is the first point. The second thing is we only imposed the, the requirement on banks of a certain size as a proxy for market power. So the rule only would have applied to $100 billion asset banks and above. And the last point was to make very clear that we're only talking about services that the bank offers. So if you're not in the uh, secured lending business or the asset-based lending business, naturally you're not gonna lend to an oil and gas company because you don't do that business. And if you don't do it for anybody, you certainly don't have to do it for them. But what we were trying to get at, and I, I think this is intuitive, but gosh, tell me if I'm wrong about this. If you offer business checking accounts, which many banks do, you can't offer a business checking account to a wind farm but deny the business checking account to the oil company. Neither of those presents credit risk or any other kind of financial risk to you. Um, that's just a fee for service business. Why are you not granting the checking account to the oil company? That's a question no one ever really adequately answered. Okay, I'll go. Uh, I'll come back to some of that, but on up risk, um, and thanks for the question. Um, my colleagues would think you, I might've planted that question because I was just doing an up risk grant yesterday. Um, so for those who don't know, operational risk is sort of distinguishable from credit risk or market risk. And it's basically complicated, but basically the risk that something's going to break. Um, this has clearly over the last five years been the sort of next great frontier for bank examination um, under the rubrics of vendor management, third party vendor management recently, fourth party vendor management. And basically you have to make sure that everything's always going to work. And that mean, mean sort of inadvert or indirectly supervising your cloud provider or your law firm cybersecurity, et cetera. Um, of course, you know, we got a good reality check in the pandemic and it turns out that banks around the country were able to go completely off, you know, off premises uh, through virtual work really without any operational problem at all, which is astounding. Um, it would seem to argue that in fact, they don't need a lot of regulation of their operational risk, um, but we have yet to see on that. Um, of course, what it's really now about in terms of operational risk is cyber risk. Um, and there, I think, you know, I, and I think there's currently very good discussions about this. And the question is, if you're worried about bank cyber risk, is the answer to send in some examiners who did credit risk and AML last week, and now they're going to come in and check to make sure you have a lot of policies and procedures, when in fact you already employ, say, five, 10,000 people doing nothing but cyber security who came all from the NSA or the Air Force or whatever, or is the better way to reduce that operational risk to actually have information sharing between the intelligence community um, and banks, or at least systemically important banks? I think there's actually a fairly good discussion going on on that, um, but it, there's certainly ways that could go awry. But of course, then there's the separate co conversation is about operational risk capital, um, which is, um, I think, a very difficult dis discussion to understand. Um, you know, banks now are required under the advanced approaches too complex to hold vast amounts of operational risk capital under the final bank Basel Accord. Uh, the, at least the largest banks will be required to hold vastly more operational risk capital. When in fact, when you look at it, they really don't lose a lot of money on operational risk. I mean, even big cyber events, it's, if it's, even if it's a denial of service, that's not a material financial loss in most cases. Um, and in fact, the way they, cop they calculate operational risk capital, originally there was something called the AMA or Advanced Management Approach. Um, which completely failed. Uh, currently, the new approach at Basel, which presumably the U.S. would adopt in some form, although I would argue against it, is the SMA, which basically says your op risk is a function of your net income. So no relation to your operations, just if you make this much money, then you have this much operational risk, which is you know, sort of intellectually bankrupt. And, but what it's really always been more about previously was just your litigation losses. 
Um, so your cyber risk is basically how much you paid in mortgage settlements as a result of the last financial crisis, even if you got out of mortgage, by the way. Um, so it is it is an area, I think, of very little intellectual rigor where the numbers are just kind of made up on the capital side. Um, but I do think on the in the in the in the real world of what's your actual operational risk, banks have demonstrated extraordinary resilience. And I think also the government's actually doing a pretty good job of that. Just two other quick notes on, and perhaps to mediate between Chris and Brian, I would note there's a there's a big difference between reputational risk management and AML KYC, which I spent a lot of time on. Um, you know, in fact, you could actually argue if if you're forced to debank people, you can't actually file suspicious activity reports. So, you know, there's no reason, you know, I would think if it's a legal business, the bank should be able to bank it. But then if there are all these bad things that Chris is talking about going on, well, the bank is under an obligation to note that and file suspicious activity report and, and identify for law enforcement that that is in fact occurring. And if they fail to do that, as USB did, I don't believe they were actually engaged in money laundering. In fact, in fact, I think they were cited for failure to adopt a sufficiently rigorous program to notice that there was bad activity going on, which is the norm for these things. But again, if, if you can't bank them, well, then you can't really be spying on them for the government, which is, you know, cynically sort of what AML KYC is really about, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, so perhaps that is a middle ground. And then I, I, to Brian, I mean, well, again, we've done this before, but I mean, I, I think, you know, my quibble with fair access is that there was, I mean, as you know, you know, it was about market power, but you, there was a presumption that every large bank had mar market power in all these markets. And I, I think a lot of these are very competitive markets. Um, so that I, I had a little quibble with that. So much for me. All right. Well, I think we can turn now to questions and answers. And uh, we will be taking questions only through AirMeet. Uh, there's no way to ask questions of the speakers on other platforms. Uh, use the raise hand button located in the middle of your screen, bottom middle of your screen, if you want to ask a question live. Or an AirMeet participant can enter text questions in the Q&A tab in the upper right hand uh, section of their screen. And we already have some questions. And this first question, I think um, I'll start with Professor uh, Skinner. It says, putting aside government intervention, how do we address the secondary problem of bank CEOs exercising their own political preferences in deciding which companies to bank? For example, Citibank and Bank of America regarding firearms manufacturers and retailers. This has become more of a societal problem as banking has become more concentrated with a handful of banks running syndicated lending. Can you start with that, Professor Skinner? Yes, absolutely. So you put your finger on a really important issue and it's sort of the other side of the coin here. You know, I'll start by saying I don't think I have the answer of how to address it, but I'll give some context and set up the question. Maybe some of the other panelists want to provide some suggestions. I mean, you know, I think big picture, we've been discussing all these various regulatory pressures that could be or have been leveled against banks, but it's certainly worth us considering also this endogenous pressure that's coming from within the banking sector itself. And I think what's interesting is that over the past couple of years, you've really seen these academic debates spill over into the boardroom in terms of uh, so-called corporate purpose, right? And, you know, I'll use the example of climate, I guess, because it's a big live issue right now, but it, it applies equally to other sectors that have or may become politically or popularly un unpopular. Um, you know, there's a bandwagon effect. So all of the banks made these commitments to go to net zero as of April of this year, I think. And, you know, it seems like it was really kicked off by asset managers and then it made the rounds through banks. And it seems like the banks really seem to think that this is something they need to do to compete or retain customers and talent even on this new sort of climate focused dimension. And, you know, I think one of the major reasons why customers and clients and even the institutional shareholders are pressing for these various commitments from the banks is because of this rhetoric around corporate purpose. And this debate was really set up years ago to challenge the shareholder primacy model, this notion that was, you know, first sort of famously espoused by Milton Friedman 
that companies should maximize profits for their shareholders and should use that as the principal rationale for just sort of guiding which projects to undertake. Now, Friedman is often misquoted, I think, as endorsing you know, this idea that companies should do anything possible to pursue profit, but he never said that. He was always clear that companies needed to play within the letter of the law. Um, you know, but in its place, there was this growing push to supplant the shareholder primacy model with conversations about a stakeholder model, right? And in its strongest form, that companies should pursue things other than profits, that they should pursue the interests of other stakeholders. So their customers, their employees, the environment, um, or in a lighter version of it, that companies should certainly you know, consider the interests of stakeholders when they're deciding which projects to undertake. Um, I always thought it was a bit of a false paradigm because in my opinion, successful companies always take a long-term view and do necessarily take in view stakeholder interests when they're deciding how to pursue profit maximizing activities. Um, but of course, you know, one key stakeholder that has really emerged in all of this is the environment and the implications that has on banks' business models. And so I think that's the broader debate, which is, I think, what is motivating a lot of a lot of corporate America, including the banks, to voluntarily take on these initiatives without any additional pressure from the regulators. But I'm very interested to hear what the other panelists think about this. Would anyone else like to jump in on this issue? I thought that was a terrific summary of where we are. Well, let me, uh, uh, speaking as a, a judge, I, I'm interested in the legal framework here. One of the things that I've heard is that the government uh, here is that the government doesn't have legal authority to pressure private industry to uh, further the government's policy goals, or the legal authority at least is is questionable. But, but my question would be, does doing so violate any law? Is there a legal action that could succeed here? And, and maybe I'll aim my question at Mr. Bear since uh, he was involved, you were involved in, um, in a legal action against Operation Choke Point. Um, well, it's, it's funny. A lot of things in, in banking these days that I think banks have the, the legal ability to push back, but not necessarily the, the will or practical ability. Um, I mean, if, if you think about the authority that um, a regulatory agency has over a bank, um, you know, there is the, the authority to enforce violations of law. And then the major statute is 12 U.S.C. 1818, which f forbids a bank from engaging in unsafe or unsound practices or being in an unsafe or unsound condition. There is actually a fair amount of jurisprudence. There's a slight circuit split, but not huge circuit split in terms of what that means. Um, I think the D.C. Circuit rule being the most... Um, popular and also since banks can ch always challenge in the DC circuit, as you might know, um, probably the one that's that's most uh, determinative. Um, and that really finds that in order for an agency to prohibit a practice under 1818, you know, there has to be, the words are a little unclear, but basically a, a risk of material financial loss to the institution. Um, I would say a lot of the focus on activities uh, through the exam process does not really meet that standard. And you know, certainly, you know, given some of the examples we've heard today, those would not in any way um, represent that kind of loss. So you could argue that a lot of the of the mandates um, are not, you know, qualifying either under a classic violation of law or an unsafe or unsound practice. Um, and then the next question, which is really, I mean, I think what occupies a lot of our thoughts in terms of how banking works and what makes it so complicated is, well, that assumes that you're actually willing to contest an 1818 action, which means that the, the, the agency actually files a complaint against the bank and says you violated 1818. That never happens. I mean, you can check your records. I mean, the, the list of contested bank examinations is, is, is basically zero for generations. And that's really because the, and this gets back to why reputational risk is such a useful tool to examiners um, and the agency more broadly, is that banks don't really have the ability to fight with the regulators in court because that's seen as a reputational risk. Uh, it's seen that you can't get along with your regulators, um, your shareholders don't like it, your board, trust me from personal experience, your board does not like it. Um, and so there is always, and, and again, all of this is going on behind the scenes under the cloak of examination secrecy. So you are, you know, much better advised to do what you are told or after some, after some haggling. Um, 
And you know, so you never really get to litigate these issues in any meaningful way. There's an in, internal supervisory process where you can do examination appeals, but you're actually applying to the to the agency that um, gave you the examination rating. So um, again, Professor Hill, who I really admire, uh, did a whole analysis of um, bank examination appeals and shows that you always lose. Um, so um, you know, the, the courtrooms are empty when it when it comes to banks being able to challenge. Uh, mandates like that. So that's why you see things like this actually going on when you check, when you drill down, as I like to, and say what's really the legal authority for it, it, it becomes less and less relevant over time, it, it fears. I mean, it's funny, I'm an adjunct at Georgetown Law School, and I always feel kind of silly because I teach, you know, ch a chapter or, a, court or a, a class on, you know, bank administrative procedures, and you have to at the end just say, well, everything I've just told you is irrelevant. Um, you know, because you don't have contested actions, you don't really do this. And and I think a whole other topic potentially for the Federal Society, I mean, over time you have, and this gets to what Brian and I think we're agreeing about, you know, you've seen a drift away from doing notice and comment rulemaking to issuing guidance, which they are at pains to say is not binding like a, 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 an informal rulemaking under the APA, um, but in practice, the examiners treat it as binding and, you know, perhaps to their discredit, bank compliance departments certainly treat it as binding. Um, so you sort of have this vast, um, you know, library. And I, at one point, it, when I was at one bank, had to do a list of the, I think it was several hundred rules that, or things that our board had to be doing, or a committee of our board had to be doing. Um, and that involved cataloging every piece of guidance, every issue. Um, now, of course, I could have told them this is not technically binding, but that was not an answer. Um, it's guidance issued by an agency, so we have to certify to our board that they are doing this or, you know, we're in big trouble. So, you know, it's, I think it's very frustrating for rule of law folks and perhaps actually for circuit judges um, that you don't see a lot of these cases because there's just no ability to get them into um, a, a court under your article of the Constitution. Anyone have a comment on that? Does anyone think there is a possible uh, legal action here? We, we know that the... Um, um, the district court thought that there was at least a possible due process argument. So I'm curious if uh, anyone shares that view. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in, Judge. I, I, I don't. I, I guess the first off, I I think that that uh, my comment has to be read. Um, uh, in the context of lots of different uh, agency overlapping agency jurisdictions and legal theories, um, you know, unlike Brian, who works at, at, at the control of the currency, I worked at the CFPB. I'm a little more familiar with the unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices framework of the Dodd Frank Act. But just for a moment, imagine that you have a you know a, a company that's making illegal loans under state law, and the state law renders those loans non-existent; they're void. Um, you, then it's not it's not lawful for that that particular type of business to collect the loan. And now further, let's assume that the the that the bank has been processing payments, collecting those loans on behalf you know the payments to to from the borrowers. Uh, and if if that happens a one off thing, well the bank can't really be expected to know. But on the other hand, it, it, suppose that the bank is uh, uh, doing that to the tune of billions and billions of dollars, uh, and there are you know, widespread exposés, uh, and the bank acting as a service provider to that lender it knows and is winking and making uh, you know extraordinary profits, facilitating an illegal online business. In my view, there is a strong argument that the bank is engaged in a deceptive, unfair, or abusive practice as a service provider for the original lender. Uh, so I do, and, and of course, that's not. I'm not sure that was responsive to the the safety and soundness, reputational risk, or or, or if it's in the context of an examination. Um, but these things can come up lots of different ways, and I'd want to drill uh, down to the particular uh, a transaction for each the particulars for each transaction and which agency is bringing it, which whether or not it's a private citizen that's bringing it. But once a bank starts processing payments for loans that are for, for any type of service that's illegal under some state or, or, or local law, there's a real chance that the bank is going to start to get closer and closer to potential liability, in my view. Any comments? Well, I have one uh, final question for Professor uh, Skinner. Um, Putting this in a historical context, is it novel, this, this approach that the Fed is taking? 
uh, pressuring industry behind the scenes, or is this something we've seen before? Yeah, so this will, you know, bring me back into some totally different work that I'm doing. And, you know, I want to be clear, I think, I don't think that the Fed is pressuring banks at all right now. I think that there is a live conversation about whether that's a possible direction the Fed could go in that is starting to look like a bit of a parallel to the things that we were talking about in connection with some of the agencies, um, which is why I raised it. But yet at the same time, you know, there are past periods in history where the Fed and I would guess the other agencies too have, you know, had to confront this question about whether they should use the policy tools at their disposal to try and, you know, either steer the economy in certain directions or certainly steer credit in certain directions. And I think, you know, in response to your question about how to situate this in historical context, I think perhaps the most analogous period, at least for the Fed, would be in the 1920s, ironically, um, 100 years ago, where, you know, there was increasing concern about the imminent stock market bubble. And, you know, when you look at that history, which is fascinating, by the way, you, you see that the Fed board, of course, you know, much newly out of the gate at that point, uh, try and engage in something called direct action, where there was a little bit of an attempt to try and lean on the reserve banks, to try and lean on banks to not lend for speculative purposes. And it may not surprise you to learn that the policy was short lived because it just generally made legislators and people uncomfortable that this could be applied in a non-discriminatory way. And I guess the upshot of that is um, old wine and new bottles. It's it's not a new problem. And, you know, it's, it's, it's good to continue the conversation because often I see when we look back at history, these issues, as in all areas, do tend to repeat themselves. And I think they probably are here as well. Well, thank you for that. That's a good note uh, to end our panel. Um, Air Meet offers us a great opportunity to meet up with old friends or meet new ones in our lounge. Please join us in the lounge to network with other participants or ask questions of some of our panelists. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for a truly excellent and illuminating presentation. And I'd also like to thank the audience for uh, your participation. Uh, a reminder that the next conference event is a discussion of regulating social media in the new administration and that will begin at 11 a.m eastern time tomorrow but stand by now for the alert directing you to the lounge <laughs>